and why I dislike them. <laughs> so just two quick examples from the recent literature of, of people, well, a person in this case, but that's sort of non-specific, just like pulled good quotes from these papers. So a recent sort of review commentary arguing that soft sweeps might be the dominant mode of adaptation um, across many different kinds of species, and a recent research paper saying that uh, practically all of the strongest and most recent sweeps in Melanogaster, um, and they're arguing the top 50 hits in Melanogaster, in fact, are all more consistent with soft rather than hard sweeps. Um, this one's not so bad, this one is, um, yeah. So let's just get on the same page with model definitions as a starting point. So let's go left to right here. So this is a hard sweep as um, we all are very familiar with this population genesis where we have a time point here where beneficial mutation arises on a chromosome carrying other neutrals and at the time of fixation we can fix our beneficial closely linked neutrals and hitchhike to some intermediate frequency um, mutations at some recombination distance away. Okay, that's out of the way. So soft selective sweeps are referring to a variety of things as I'll explain in a moment. These are two common ones. So one is selection on standing variation. So we have some mutation that was at some um, frequency in the population greater than 1 over 2n. It was segregating neutrally or slightly deleteriously. At some point it became beneficial, and when it's beneficial it's sitting on multiple haplotypes, and so those haplotypes can all be brought to some intermediate frequency because just the beneficial mutation is what needs to come to fixation. The other model commonly invoked for soft sweeps is multiple beneficials, so in this case I'm drawing a beneficial mutation occurring at the same site. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. You have beneficial one, green here. You have a second independent beneficial mutation, the same change, just independently occurring, and thus they're on different haplotypes, and you get a pattern that's more or less similar. You have your beneficial mutation fixing, but rather than fixing your whole local neighborhood, um, you're just bringing multiple haplotypes to intermediate frequency. So I'll just say in words, a hard sweep is sort of this classic model that we've thought about for a long time where selection is acting on a rare mutation. Um, a soft sweep isn't really a model to me, it's more of a pattern. So I would say soft sweep is a definition that keeps being in some flux in the literature, but it's not really model-based. It's really just positive selection that results in multiple haplotypes at the, kind of, at the time of fixation. That seems to be the common unifying theme among people who are arguing for soft sweeps. Today I'm just going to briefly touch on two that I think are the most common which I introduced in this slide before, selection on standard variation and selection on multiple beneficials. Okay, so let's start with a few thoughts on selection on standing variation. A few assumptions of note. Um, one, as we said, the allele was segregating at appreciable frequency, neutral or nearly neutral, prior to becoming beneficial. Okay, that's sort of key by definition for this model. The second is multiple different haplotypes are segregating at appreciable frequency carrying this allele. Right? We need both this guy segregating, but we also need different haplotypes segregating carrying this beneficial. If it's on the same haplotype, then it just looks like a hard sweep. And three, which might be a little contentious to some people, but I think is sort of clear to me, it's assuming epistasis doesn't exist. In other words, the beneficial mutations sitting on this haplotype and this haplotype are selectively equivalent. Okay? There's no selection differential, and that's sort of a hard biological pill to swallow, I would say, but it is what it is. Okay, we know something about this model actually quite a bit, starting from Warren Betancourt, and Hermeson has done a lot of nice work on this over the years. Um, for the, um, so the, the number of haplotypes at the time of fixation, for the key parameters here that we'll focus on, are the selection coefficient before the shift, that is, when this thing was segregating in the population, how deleterious was it, or was it neutral, and the selection coefficient after the shift, that is, how beneficial did it become, um, after the shift in pressure. I'm just going to touch on two examples of the kind of data that I think can inform us in thinking about what this SB, that doesn't work, I'm pretty tall, what this SB over SD 
um, value is. So two experimental examples, so one from Kaysen and Bataillon that argued that 95% of antibiotic resistance mutations in Pseudomonas were deleterious in the absence of treatment, that is before the treatment is administered, they were in the population of mutation selection balance, they were deleterious. My lab works a lot on drug resistance in influenza. For all of our identified resistance mutations, these guys are also deleterious in the absence of drug, right? This sort of experimental system is really where we can nail SB and SD quite specifically, okay? We also have natural population examples we can think about. We've also thought a lot about um, the Nebraska Sandhills mice with Hopi Hoaxers lab over the years, and we see that this adaptive light phenotype, that is adaptive on light sand, is deleterious in the surrounding dark substrate. That's not a huge surprise. It's not great to be a light mouse on dark soil. Um, another nice study in Arapidopsis doing a transplant between Swedish and Italian lions and showing the locally adapted variants were deleterious in the alternate environment. All of this is simply to say, um, evidence suggests, there's many examples, here's a handful, um, the beneficials are um, probably unlikely, in my opinion, to be segregating neutrally prior to the shift, right? Things that are changing the phenotype in a way that's affecting fitness um, aren't probably, often, hanging out in your population neutrally, in my opinion, okay? at least from the evidence that we have. And so they won't be a, stand, a sufficient standing frequency to result in a soft selective sweep at the time of the shift. Okay, let's talk about selection on multiple beneficials quickly. So in this model, the beneficial mutation rate must be extraordinarily large, such that you have this green beneficial occur, and the second beneficial must hit the same site before the sojourn time of the first, okay? So in relatively rapid succession. So this is a pretty large number. Or the mutational target size to the beneficial phenotype needs to be large. That is, if it's not just a single site that gives you this selection coefficient or this beneficial phenotype, but rather a dozen sites, say any knockout will do the job, okay, then the target size is bigger. That makes it a little more attainable. And we still, of course, have this epistasis problem. We need these mutations to have the same selection coefficient regardless on what haplotype they're sitting on. Okay, well, we know something about the beneficial mutation rate, I would say. So this is just a cartoon representation of the distribution of fitness effects. Um, which a lot of people in this room, including us, have thought a lot about over the years, where you have a lot of deleterious things, strongly deleterious things, and a lot of things around wild-type life, around neutrality. What I think is fair to say, I'm not going out on a limb saying this, is that the beneficial mutation rate in this tale is probably some small fraction of the overall mutation rate. Okay? Whatever you think it is, whatever shape you think this tail distribution takes, I think it's fair to say that it's um, small compared to the overall mutation rate. We know from Pennings and Hermison that this um, theta B, that is theta to the beneficial, needs to be greater than 0.04. Um, if you start thinking about that, that's a pretty big number in most species we think about. Um, perhaps it's relevant in certain viruses. Uh, Pennings has a nice example from HIV, for example, it looks fairly promising. Um, a few notes on what we know about adaptive target size, that is, how many mutational hits can give you the same phenotype, okay? Again, two experimental and two empirical results. Um, again, returning to antibiotic resistance in Pseudomonas, we know a lot about how, to, how this phenotype is made, um, and it's actually hits in this small pocket of the RNA polymerase. In influenza virus, we also know a lot about also Tamivir drug resistance, where you have to hit um, this, this pocket for near aminidase activity. Um, in sticklebacks, we know a lot about the signaling pathway. Again, in cryptic coloration, pretty much whether you're talking about mice or lizards or mammoths or people, you're always hitting M21R or Booty. My point here really is the evidence suggests the beneficial mutation rate and the adaptive target size is relatively small. That is, the number of hits you can have to give you the exact same selection coefficient is probably a small number, and thus soft sweeps from this model um, are also quite unlikely. Okay, so why are people excited about this? Um, if I were to sort of pessimistically summarize some of these papers, it might look something like this. Adapt adaptation is clearly common. Evidence for hard sweeps is uncommon, and so soft sweeps must be very important. Okay? Um, I'd just like to make the case that absence of evidence um, is an evidence of absence when it comes to hard sweeps. We know a lot about finding these guys, and we know that it's tough. That's essentially what we know for sure. Here I'm just showing you performance for three uh, of the most commonly used hard sweep statistics, sweep finder, sweet, and omega plus. 
um, across different selection intensities um, for a neutral model and a, a bottleneck model, and you see that power really rarely exceeds 40%. That is, it's still pretty hard to find hard sweeps. So just because we don't see them all over the place doesn't mean they're not there. Um, this same scrutiny, though, really hasn't been brought to soft selective sweep patterns. So the most common thing is just seeing these multiple haplotypes, that is, long stretches of LD. We know a lot of demographic models that do this. The kind of thinking that's gone into what demographic models can produce hard sweep patterns really hasn't gone into thinking about what demographic models can produce soft sweep patterns yet, and this needs to happen. The other thing I'll mention, and I'll close on this actually, is that hard sweeps actually cause soft sweep patterns, right? This is something that um, has only recently been talked about. This nice paper by um, Andy Kern's lab, by Schreider et al., made the simple case that even in our hard sweep model, we have a beneficial mutation um, that arises and some things recombine off. Um, well, that's a mutation sitting on multiple haplotypes, and that's really a standard prediction of hitchhiking models with a combination. Here they're just showing uh, IHS in this case, something that's commonly used to describe soft sweeps around the hard sweep fixation. So this is your hard sweep fixation in the middle, and this is your soft sweep pattern the hard sweep is producing. Okay? So essentially everything produces soft sweep patterns, including hard sweeps, as sort of the bottom line here. Okay, so the take home here um, to me is I'm not arguing that models of selection on standing variation aren't important, because we have many examples in the literature where that's exactly what happened, I think or that models of multiple competing beneficials aren't important. We have many examples of those as well. What I am arguing is that soft selective sweeps are unlikely under these models, okay? So whether you're talking about selection on de novo mutations, or standing genetic variation, or multiple competing beneficials, there's a very large parameter space for all three of these models will result in a hard sweep rather than a soft sweep, okay? Um, and most of the points here, and many more um, illustrative data examples than I could show in 12 minutes, are in this sort of review commentary um, I wrote last year. On that, I'd just like to thank my lab members for feedback on this work as I was thinking about it and writing it. Um, current numbers in blue and former numbers in black with their current uh, locations. Thank you very much. standing variation, but standing variation can still result in a hard sweep, right? We just mean that it's rare. We really mean that it's at a frequency something like 1 over 2 NES. So even if there is standing variation for selection to act on quickly, and I totally agree we have examples of that, it still results in a hard sweep unless that frequency is quite high. Yeah. Or in Betancourt did some really nice calculations of this in their 2001 paper and showed that, you know, just as one example of a sort of common versatile like parameter space, you needed something like 400 to 500 copies segregating in your population before you had an appreciable probability of fixing two of them at the time of fixation. So they can be hanging out there. They just have to be super common for a soft sweep to result rather than a hard sweep. Yes? Besides mutation rate and target size for beneficial mutation, put in a large enough population size allow you to have enough data for mutation for all of the mutations Yep, but target size is still important. Sense, right? I mean, this is population scale mutation rate, so any mu is really what we're interested in here, right? Um, but target size is still relevant to me because whether or not you need to hit the exact same site um, in short order, right, or whether you have a dozen or a hundred sites that you can hit to get the same type of effect obviously matters with how large this mutation rate needs to be. But sure, I mean, this is why, say, viruses are likely the place we'll see it, and I think, um, like I said, Pennings. Uh, and Wakely had a very nice paper last year in HIV where it looks like they had just that, a resistance mutation that hit the exact same twice, site twice in short order, and this is owing to large NEU in the population. So I think it happens, I just think it's an extreme parameter range relative to the species in which people are arguing for soft sweeps. Like for soft sweeps, that's right. Yeah. So when you talked about um, the, the unlikeliness of two uh, mutations involving independently that have the exact same so selection coefficient. Yep. So if their selection coefficients are a little different, um, can it slow down the fixation 
can the, the weaker one slow down the fixation of, of the superior um, to the point where you get something in between a soft and a hard speed, so yeah. allow for more recombination around it? Yeah, so Hermison and I were just at a workshop uh, <coughs> in the Swiss Alps last week together, which was good fun, um, where we sort of agreed that when we talk about these patterns, we're not really talking about different things. When he talks about soft sweeps, he's talking about it in this sense as a sort of intermediate um, phase before a hard sweep happens. And that phase can be long, depending on how you think about time scales. But that's a good example, right? So if you have two um, beneficials that have a slightly different S, they're still moving through the population. And once every individual has one or the other, then that differential is quite small. And so the time between that soft sweep pattern and the hard sweep pattern couldn't be long, right? It's essentially selection on a weekly beneficial at that point. So I agree that it can be a transient phase, but those things really have to be nearly identical for it to stop at that point, and that's sort of, sort of my point. Good. Thank you very much.